Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. It's uh, Wednesday, December 8th. It's 11 a.m. Um, and I will call this meeting to order. So uh, today we are going to continue our discussion of the medical program. Um, as we discussed last week, we have some um, specific directives uh, and some recommendations in our legislation to um, align our uh, medical program with our adult use, uh, adult use recreational program. Uh, to the extent that we can, and also to ensure that no uh, new rule that we create is more restrictive than the current set of rules. So, um, just a few administrative details. Um, a reminder that our exploratory committee is meeting tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m. to discuss the board's reporting requirements um, for our January 15th report. Um, this, uh, the agenda is posted, we're going to be talking about special license types, delivery licenses, um, and a few other uh, just very kind of specific uh, reporting requirements. And then uh, the board uh, will meet again um, on Friday at 11 a.m. and uh, we will post the agenda for that um, when it's ready. So. Um, I would take a mo have has everyone reviewed the minutes from yes. the second? Yeah. Take a motion to approve the minutes from December second. So moved. Second. Third. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry, December third. Sorry. Um, and um, all right, why don't we just move directly to the agenda? So again, today we're going to be talking about the medical program and some um, specific issues um, that we need to um, discuss and decide. And uh, I will turn things over to Bryn. Okay, so I have uh, just a few slides to go through that kind of tease up um, the different questions that I think that you, the board, needs to make some decisions about where um, rules one and two that we've pre-filed differ from the DPS rule. And as Pepper just mentioned, there's, like a, there's a statutory requirement, 7 VSA 956, that the board has to adopt rules um, governing the medical program that are no more restrictive than the existing DPS rule. Um, so that is something to bear in mind as, as we talk about um, as we talk about this. So, just at the outset here, um, some things to keep in mind as as we go through these decision points. Um, as I said, medical rule has to be no more restrictive than the DPS rule, and the board should strive for consistency with rules one and two wherever you can. Um, and so that means that if the DPS rule is less restrictive than um, what you've decided on in rule one or two, really your choices are either to adopt the DPS language or come up with an alternative that's no more restrictive than what DPS um, has said. So a couple other points. If the board decides that a dispensary rule should track um, either one or two, then what that means is that the dispensary rule is um, going to follow whatever portion of rule one or two applies to that um, part of their operations. And if a dispensary is also an integrated licensee, any portion of that operation that's also servicing the adult use market is going to be required to follow that relevant portion of rules one or two except for if it's uh, the retail portion of that operation and then both the medical rule and the adult use rules are going to apply to the same location if it's servicing both programs. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to start with, uh, and also something I just wanted to mention is that I have up here the um, DPS rule and also rules one or two. So if you guys want to look at a particular portion of any of those, I can quickly pull it up as we go through these. So we talked briefly at the last meeting about the definition of caregiver. Um, that existing statutory definition is scheduled to sunset on March 1st and there's not a replacement in statute. And there's also not um, a, a definition of caregiver that's in the DPS rule currently. So um, if the board decided to adopt the current statutory definition in our rule, um, it would read as follows at the bottom part of the slide there. 
a person who's at least 21, has met the qualification requirements as determined by the board in accordance with the rule, and agreed to undertake responsibility for managing the well-being of a registered patient with respect to the use of cannabis for symptom relief. So we've heard repeatedly um, from caregivers and people in the program that they don't want this definition changed. I think the only reason why changing it has even come up is because the symptom relief oversight and the medical subcommittee have both said, well, you know, we're okay with increasing the caregiver rotation ratio if it only means kind of administering medicine, if it only means um, going to the dispensary on behalf of a patient. You know, they would, they would support if you bifurcated the definition to an unlimited patient caregiver ratio, if that's what caregiver meant. Mm -hmm. And you start going to the kind of other responsibilities of a caregiver, um, including designated cultivator. Um, that's where those two um, groups do not support increasing the ratio. So I honestly think if we're going to make a recommendation to increase the ratio to you know one to two, one to three, whatever we decide, that we just leave this definition alone. I agree. I did think that it was current that caregiver was in the current DPS rule. It is, but it essentially tracks. Okay, because it says something about the, um, that you can't be both a registered patient. Did I misread this? Perhaps like both a registered patient and a caregiver. Does it say that? I don't believe that that's EPS in rule? the definition. Oh, okay. In this definition. Okay. Maybe some other piece that you're thinking of. But yeah, my only not. thought was that sh that that piece should go away. That you should be if if that's maybe I was looking at something that's old, but um, that you should be able to be a registered patient and a registered caregiver if if that's. But again, maybe I was looking at something that was outdated. I'm supportive of keeping it the same and not having to Okay. 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 Any more discussion on that point? Um, not on that, but if you could just pull up the 100 best songs. Of <laughs> I'd like to know. What you're we can do that after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I think we'll keep the definition the same. Okay. Okay. So, we're going to move on to patient um, registration process and caregiver registration process. This um, is set out in section three and four of the DPS rule, and there isn't an analog in the board rules. Um, so is there a reason to deviate from what's set out in the DPS rule? I had a few um, comments on this. Um, I think the notarized application is probably unnecessary, but it leads me to a which is in 3.1.1. Um, but it leads me to a larger question is, I thought that DPS or, or the VMR, the registry, had started a transition to electronic um, application submission. Is that something that we know the answer to? Maybe it's a question for Kimberly. Lindsay's behind you shaking her head. Or Lindsay. <laughs> All right. So is there a... Is there a, well, can you join us, do you mind? Just so that people can see your face. <laughs> I'm sorry, our rules are at the Thanks for joining us. Welcome. No one has a No notary. Okay, so we should remove that. It was rule. in statute, and we okay. got rid of that a few years ago. Gotcha. So, um, yes, they can register online. Okay. It's like an approved, a department approved form. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So yes, then I would suggest that we just eliminate that if it's not, if it's kind of an outdated portion of the rule anyway. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then could we pull up the medical rule? Sure. 
I was looking specifically at 3.1.1.5. So this idea that um, you have to choose between cultivating and designating a dispensary. No. Okay. So good. So that apparently is out of date as well. So I would say we eliminate 3.1.1.5 and I think 3.5.2 is similar and 3.5.3 .3 has a similar. Mm -hmm. Are they here? Yeah. Are these the ones? 2015 is the most. I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Okay. Yeah, they have not been updated to mirror changes in the statute. Okay. Because, you know. Adult use was going to come along at some point. Right. <laughs> um, Can I ask another question? Yeah. If someone's a um, patient, and maybe the law is just silent on this, which would be my preference, are they so they get a grow allowance of two mature, seven immature, and is that in addition to their? regular adult use home grow allowance, which is two mature and four immature that every Vermonter is allowed to grow? Yeah, it's not clear. It doesn't address it's that. It's silent on that? Okay. That's, I think that's Does better. it also, um, if you're a patient and a caregiver, does that increase the limit? Can you grow a certain amount for your if you're for your for as a caregiver, and then if you're a patient, can you do, does it double? Has it doubled the amounts? Well, so historically, no, because the possession limit was the possession limit. Okay. It wasn't like you got the possession limit times three because you had two cards and you're over twenty one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think that's all I have for that. Um, in three, five, three, they no longer have to grow in a single secure indoor facility. The language mirrors the adult use cultivation requirements. Okay, so enclosed lock facility. Yeah. Okay. Shielded from public view or mm -hmm. however that goes. I said two points of clarification. Right? One is on 3.5.1. My understanding is you had already decided that there's not going to be any designated dispensaries. And just to let you all know, my plan is knowing that decision, I'll put that in everywhere it needs to be put in. Yeah. So okay. Don't worry about that. Um, and then the second thing, going back, Julie, you were right. There was that sentence. I apologize. I was looking at the wrong document. I thought I was looking at okay. one definition. I was looking at the other one. Um, it, there was that sentence about not being currently registered patient, but if we adopt the statutory definition, it won't be we'll issue. Okay. All right, good. Okay, we ready to move on? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, dispensary application procedure. Um, we've got DPS rule section five, and, and I should start out by saying um, where the DPS rule and proposed rules one or two cover some, so something similar or the same thing, David and I have kind of made a judgment call about um, whether one is more or less restrictive than the other. Um, that obviously will be open to interpretation under some circumstances, so we've kind of indicated here what, where we're landing on it. Um, and, for, and for this one, there you can make an argument that the um, this, the DPS rule is really similar in effect to what um, you've required in Rule 1. So I've kind of summarized here what dispensary application applicants have to do um, when they're applying for a license. They've got to address a series of criteria and measures um, that are summarized here. Business plan and facility information, overall health needs of registered patients, safe and secure communities and the various measures um, responsive to those criteria. Um, and the DPS rule also requires that a panel can be convened to evaluate and score each application, and that panel would include a registered patient, registered caregiver, and then staff from the medical program. 
So let me know if you'd like me to pull up um, DPS rule section five. Does the number of allowed dispensaries change with think, this legislation? I think it goes away. Okay. Yeah. There's no more, you need to reach a certain amount right. of patients on the registry right. in order to open I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. I mean, Lindsay, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I kind of <clears throat> think about this. I think our applic the way I've, I've read the dispensary application is it's it's not as prescriptive as our as our application, but it's not necessarily as restrictive either. It's just more about you tell us what you want to do versus certain requirements, and then there's a judgment call made by a panel or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, and this is only for the initial application. So, um, and the we also. Were ha we had open periods when we accepted right. dispensary applications because there was a limit. Mm -hmm. So they only could apply when there was a license available. That would be a little different too. Yeah. So that like the whole panel thing, um, and we they, we usually had some sort of outside person on the panel too that wasn't familiar with the program mm -hmm. to sort of have an outside perspective, but um, it's a little, little bit more of a lift for renewals if you're going to do a panel. So I would say yes, I think it should track the um, what's in rule one with perhaps two additional things. There should be a plan for educating their staff, particularly on the level of competency for the type of advice they're providing and then a plan for patient privacy, privacy, which I think we sort of have in some of our rules, but not necessarily as part of the application process. So then this just gives me the, just the original kind of baseline determination that we made on slide one, which is, you know, we're talking about these dispensary applications. Um, of the current dispensaries that are likely to seek integrated licenses and then their retail operation is potentially going to be commingled with their dispensary retail and their certainly their inventory will likely be commingled. Um, so is if we add what Julie just said, can it apply to the non-integrated licenses that also have a dispensary or would it just be new dispensaries that are not part of the integrated license? Uh, you know, with that kind of no more restrictive than the current DPS rule. Are you applying dispensary just the term to dispensary just to medical or yeah. to any retail? Okay. Just to medical. Okay. Sorry, can you? I lost the thread. I think, of I, think I need a repeat. <laughs> so, um, obviously, we can apply our rules to adult rec rules, the integrated licenses. And because they have the ability to co-mingle their canopy and their retail operations, then we can apply these rules to, to them, even if they're more restrictive. Um, but if we're talking about a dis current dispensary that doesn't seek an integrated license, how much more restrictive can we get on education requirements? On, you know, how much more specific can we get? And is there a difference between restrictive and specific? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I think that, I do think that if you are uh, putting something in that requires something, somebody to do something that they weren't required to do before, mm -hmm. I think most a court, if this were ever litigated, would likely say that that was more restrictive. You're yeah. forcing action that there had, that had been required previously, and so that's a restricting action. Yeah. Um, so, and I do think that when you're talking only about dispensary operations, for in that example where somebody is not also an integrated licensee, uh, then we are. The statute's pretty clear on that. It's a it's a pretty direct command that it simply won't be more restrictive. Yeah. The, they sort of have the guidance around be as close to rules one and two as you can be, but it's a real command that you cannot be more yeah. restrictive. Well then, so I, um, I'm fine with adopting rule one for the dispensary application procedures for folks that are integrated licenses and dispensaries. 
but and then leaving the DPS rule, Section 5, for dispensaries that are not going to be integrated licensees. If that makes sense to everyone. I didn't see anything in there that we need to eliminate, for instance, from the DPS rule. So your vote, or sorry, your suggestion would be to adopt wholesale the DPS rule for licensing new dispensaries? I think so. Okay. I didn't see anything to eliminate there. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea of no more restrictive, right? What can we eliminate? That's right. I mean, I think the, the choice here is since um, the judgment call here is that they're approximately the same in effect, yeah. you could choose either one without being in violation of the statute. Okay. So I think I'm confused. Are you thinking that adding a certain level of training and education is restrictive? Is that? If, well, is it in the existing rule? It's, it's, it's allowed by statute. I, I've seen that. They were allowed, the DPS is allowed to create education and training standards, but I just wonder if the current rule. It's in Section 6. In Section 6. But it, the training has to do with um, emergencies, um, understanding how to utilize the security system, and HIPAA training. They are required cannabis training. I feel like I have a fundamental concern that maybe we can't address right now. <laughs> like that we can't require a certain level of education for people who are dispensing, essentially, you know, a medical product. I don't, there's no other medical system that does that. You know, when you pick up a, a prescription from a pharmacy, they offer you education, you know, and additional information and a huge pamphlet which most people toss but it's there if you should you read it <laughs> but perhaps that's something we need to address in legislation instead well we can certainly require it on the adult use yeah. side right and i think most dispensaries do have this at least informally on the medical side but it's just not required by the rule they're required to provide patient educational materials. And I guess that's where it's like, you have to provide this material, but there's no requirement that your staffs understand it. Yeah. Right. So, but most of them do try to make sure they understand that and they try not to use the newer staff for the initial consult consultations. Um, David and Bryn, if, if the direction to us was that Rule 1, and sorry that I missed this, is no more restrictive than Rule 5 uh, for the kind of dispensary application, then I suggest we do Rule 1 for everyone. Just to make things even the, even the dispensaries yeah. that, that are not going to seek That are not going to seek anything. Or if a new dispensary wants to open up. Yeah, I think it's just more, it's more consistency. We don't have two procedures for something that we're regulating. If it's in line with the statutory directive, I think that's, I think it's better. I think it is. There's actually a couple ways in which rule one is less restrictive than DPS section five. So yeah, I, I think it, I think it balances out. It is reasonable. Okay. What about three? Uh, five, three, one, four. So that's an example where I think the DPS rule is now more restrictive. And so it would, it would go to the adult use <laughs> regulation. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> which, is, which is less restrictive than this in terms of placement. So if somebody wanted a new medical only, this wouldn't apply? It would be the drug free schools out that would apply. Okay. Makes sense. Any more conversation about that one? Not for me. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot of text on this. Um, 
so I'm not going to go through all of it, but this is um, delivery and transport. So what I've put up on the slide here is the DPS uh, regulations on delivery and transport. Um, what the board came up with in 227 is more prescriptive than what is required by DPS. So um, I don't know if the board had a chance to review what is um, required in the DPS rule, but this is a summary of it here. I guess just to be clear to everybody listening, we haven't developed delivery adult use regulations, just transportation. Right. That's right. The supply chain. Just so everybody's understanding there. Um, I just I had a question that maybe is best directed to Lindsay. Um, are delivery folks allowed to? deliver to multiple patients in a single trip? Yeah. Okay. They just can't bring extra swimmer. Right, okay. So they have to know what they're going to deliver and it has to be exactly what they do deliver. Well, the, if there has been instances where a patient may not have the money for the whole order, so they may have to bring part of the order back. Okay, got it. Um, do we require in our transport a secure locked container for every amount? No. Over 20 pounds. Over 20 pounds. So to me, I almost think that the secure lock container, which is in 6.2.1, is duplicative of, sorry, I get technically, I think it's 6.2.13. Yeah, so 6.2.13 says develop and implement policies and procedures to ensure employee safety, to provide security sufficient to prevent loss of inventory theft and diversion for the dispensing, delivery, and storage of cannabis. So it almost seems like requiring a secure lock container in every instance and then also having this catch-all. Um, I don't think we need both, and we certainly aren't gonna require a secure lock container for everything in the, on the delivery side, um, or the transport side, I should say, in the adult use. Does anyone feel like we need a secure lock container? For I guess I'm getting a little confused because there is delivery and transport and I want to make sure I understand you and your it, suggestions. 6.2.1 is any transport of cannabis or <coughs> cannabis infused products must be in a secure lock container. And it, it, we might not need to get to this level of detail on this, but and maybe secure lock container is a good idea. So dispensaries, no matter what the activity is right now, <clears throat> if it's a transport to another dispensary or to a patient or caregiver, they have to move the marijuana in a secure lock container. Does that include the trunk of the car? Or do you need something additional? Additional. Mm -hmm. Because it's like when they leave the dispensary, so to get to the car. Okay. And Right, or more delivering it, right? If you're walking into a building and delivering, right? So it would be, they'd have to carry it in a secure lock. If they're delivering it to a patient, for example, they would have to have it in a secure lock container until and it's delivered. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like for delivery to a patient that you should have to have it in some sort of secure lock container. Okay. You use like big locking bank bags right. to go to the door. Like I'm thinking if you're going into like an apartment building where you're going to be walking through a hall or it could be public space or what have you. Okay. That was the only thing I had flagged here. Um, if we're looking at things to kind of eliminate, but I'm fine with leaving that one. Yeah, in our, in our 20 pounds or, or less, no lock container language is, is to help 
some of the smaller folks move their stuff through the supply chain, not necessarily recognizing they're not necessarily going to be walking to an apartment like door. Charles, yeah. Where it became problematic was more the secure lock container was with COVID and doing curbside because they were exiting the dispensary, so they had to go out with like the lock bait bag to unlock it at the door of the car after you know the financial transaction happened. So, is there an interim rule that allowed them to leave without the secure lock container to, for all this time that they had to do the DPS determined they had to use the lock container. I'm less concerned about a lock container in their own parking lot, right, because there's other security measures there than there are when you, you know, go out in the world. I mean, we haven't talked about delivery yet, but is this something that we would require for delivery? Are you thinking it's melding conversations, but we are supposed to kind of align adult mm -hmm. use and dispensaries? I mean, if you're talking something as simple as locked banking bags, which is, you know, I don't see why that, that doesn't seem all that prohibitive. Okay. Uh, really, the worry is more the cash. Yeah. That's it, that's what somebody would try to steal. All right. Well, why don't we leave this in? Then I'm I'm fine with it. I just figured it was worth discussing. Okay. I would just <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Because it makes people look at you. <clears throat> I was just going to say, I think we've got some things to figure out on the delivery of dog use yeah. side of things, but recognizing that this framework is there if we want to take it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, visitor access um, DPS rule 6.4 and 6.5 limits access to dispensaries and cultivation and processing areas to a, a limited set of people, registry card holders, unless it's a contractor, a vendor, or an owner of the property um, that's performing services related to operation of the dispensary, government employee in the performance of their job duties, or um, EMS personnel in the performance of life safety duties. And if you'll recall, um, the decisions you made for rule two provide for uh, visitor access for cultivation sites um, and with some specific um, procedures that have to be in place if visitors do visit a site. I guess my only, my only concern would be the privacy of, of medical patients and waiting and whole slew of folks show up and then, you know, are going on a tour and mm -hmm. the, that's just my only concern. So in the retail section is what you're, or the, the actual dispensing section is the part that you're talking about? Or, or yeah. I guess so, or yeah. how, it, how it just looks or feels to a patient, yeah. potentially, that they're doing this because they have a severe mm -hmm. medical issue and people are, I don't know. That's my only thought, other. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. I think if you're talking about tours of cultivation sites, that's it's different. very different than right. having, you know, patient access and who can see who's in your in your space. So I would agree with tracking rule two with the exception of I think there's already limitations in the current DPS rule, right? So Kyle, you're, the example you're thinking of, I'm guessing, is is where the where a dispensary has both cultivation and patient service in the same location. Yeah. And then you run into the problem of a cultivation tour would still mean that patients could be seen by somebody on the cultivation tour. Yeah, I guess so. And maybe my my concern is not founded. I don't know. Um, no, that's good. So you would want to leave the DPS rule in place? I don't necessarily know if that's what I'm saying. I'm just kind of raising it as a, <laughs> raising it for a discussion that, you know, an, an integrated license holder would would be allowed to do so, but from a dispensary specific perspective. I, I don't have my mind made up about how mm -hmm. how that looks or how that feels. If it's only a dispensary, I don't think we need to change this, honestly. 
uh, like it, maybe we want to think maybe we can just brainstorm about other people that might need to access a dispensary but I just I feel like this is fine yeah I guess I'm confusing myself a little bit I'm still thinking in a situation where it is set up where everything is kind of in one building kind of like an integrated but let's say an integrated doesn't pursue a dispensary or excuse me an in, a dispensary doesn't pursue an integrated license and they're just on the dispensary side of things but they're also cultivating on site and they some you know that that's that's the scenario that i'm thinking of i don't know if that brought clarity <laughs> So you're thinking there's going to be an exemption for the cult for the dispensing area due to the cultivation? I, I don't know necessarily. I guess I think I'm confusing everybody. So is that rule two wouldn't apply to them? Well, I think that's what we're that's trying to decide. That's right what now. we're trying to decide. Um, if we would leave, I think the, the question is, would we leave the DPS rule 6.4 and 6.5 as it is, right? Or, or have it track with rule 2? How do you want to approach visitors at dispensaries? I'm fine with the DPS rule. I mean, maybe it's too restrictive, but I can't off the top of my head think of anyone else that needs to be accessing medical dispensary. The medical dispensary, other than the patients, the caregivers, the emergency service personnel, government employees, contractors, vendors. I can't think of anyone else that needs to be in there. And honestly, the idea is to kind of keep it as sterile as possible and, mm -hmm. you know, like not have a bunch of people touring it for any reason other than in the performance of a specific duty. duty. Yeah. I think I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong in my thinking, I'm sure Someone we'll hear some feedback. Us. I think keep, keep DPS for uh, access. Okay. All right, so the next um, issue is the criminal history records. <clears throat> so um, DPS rule addresses criminal history records for um, registered caregivers and also um, dispensary officers, board members, employees. So um, on the left here is what you is the list of um, offenses that you identified in 1.11, and if you remember, this is like what would presumptively disqualify you, but you also adopted um, language to, that would overcome a presumptive disqualification for um, one of these offenses on a criminal history record. So the DPS rule includes all of these offenses, um, includes listed crimes on their list of um, offenses that disqualify a person, and it also includes drug-related offenses. Um, and there is not a provision within the DPS rule for overcoming a disqualification um, based on a criminal history record for principal officers, board members, and employees. There is language um, for caregivers, however, that would overcome um, a disqualification. But in the board rule, there's that, that overcoming the presumptive disqualification applies across the board. And obviously, the list of crimes is uh, more narrow in Rule 1.11. Seven two, you can over. Seven one, you can overcome the disqualifiers, the caregivers. But that's more restrictive than 1.11. Lindsay, can you just talk very generally? Have you seen any problems with caregivers exploiting their patients? Obviously, no specifics, but. Yeah. Yes? Okay. No, it's not. Frequent. And those are people that have made it through 7.1 and 7.2 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how about on the employee side? Have you seen any um, kind of criminal 
activity from employees? Yes, but it's not, we haven't had large thefts, you know, um, minor product, yeah. um, if, if any. Um, you know, they have gotten into their own troubles yeah. okay. along the way. But yeah. Separate from their goals? Yeah. Okay. I say we go with 1.11 then um, for caregivers and for employees. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So moving on to packaging and labeling then. <clears throat> um, DPS Rule 6.6 .6 governs the packaging and labeling for um, dispensary products. And then the Board Rule 229 governs packaging and labeling. So um, the Board Rule is more restrictive, is where uh, David and I landed on this, than the DPS's rule. Um, there's a requirement in 229 that all packaging has to be child resistant and opaque. Um, which is not a requirement in DPS rule. Um, there is a requirement that the label labeling be affixed on the packaging. Um, label has to identify the strain and the weight, um, and the strains have to reflect, reflect the properties of the plant. Um, and then the label has to contain a statement that the state of Vermont doesn't attest to the medicinal value of cannabis. As you can see, these these uh, these requirements are not found in the DPS rule. And not right. <laughs> I'm fine with the DPS rule. I mean, we can't adopt our rule, so I'm fine with devolving <laughs> the DPS. Yeah, and I guess I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to hear from, I guess, through public comment on a proposed rule. I can see how two separate lines or supply chains for different labeling might be confusing and costly. It might be restrictive in long words, but practically, is it more restrictive? Well, there's nothing that would prevent an integrated license holder from, doing that. from adding whatever label, as long as it, you know, from going above and beyond Rule 6.6. .6. Right. And they could, they could and their own volition do 2.2.9 on all of their products. Yeah, I'm comfortable with it. Just yeah. It's one of those things where it might be a little, not as, on its face, it's restrictive, but maybe not in, in practice, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just um, thinking about the legislative intent of not making it more restrictive. It's not to say that so I'm just looking at these two um, columns here, but it's not to say that now medical dispensaries could use toys, inflatables, and movie characters in their packaging, right? I just want to make sure that that's that we say that clearly. So I don't know what advertising restrictions apply to yeah. the medical dispensaries currently, but we can look at that. Like, I'm fine with staying with the DPS rule, but I don't think the intent was to have a restricted adult use advertising and packaging rule and then have, you know, sort of right. anything on the other side, the medical side. I don't know that. It's just an <laughs> assumption. <laughs> it just seems logical. <laughs> My recollection is that there's not, advertising is yeah. not allowed by the at DPS all. rule. At okay. All. Yeah. But I can confirm that. 6117. Oh, okay. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that this stuff is only going to, the labeling is only going to be going to people who have patient yeah. registration cards. It's a little bit different than any adult walking into a store and making a consumer decision. Yes and no, and that it's different than any other, any other device or 
you know, regulated prescription that you would get. You would, you would, there would be labeling, there would be warnings, there would be information. The, the regulated prescriptions are already restricted in what they can use and what they can advertise. So there's, I just, I'm identifying a gap. <laughs> Okay, I think we stay with EPS yeah. for now. Okay. Um, the next slide is about security requirements. So, um, arguably, board rule is uh, less restrictive than DPS rule 6.10. So, here's a sort of a summary of what's required in the DPS rule. So, at a minimum, <clears throat> there's a requirement for exterior lighting. Um, no growth that affects the functionality of the, any security measures that are required. Um, dispensaries are required to implement devices to detect unauthorized intrusion, and there's quite a bit of language about that. Um, we can look at that language if you like. Operational security alarm that has specific controls, including access control, alerting equipment, control panel, fire sensors, panic buttons, <coughs> and perimeter sensors. And then video surveillance requirement that um, is required to monitor all areas that contain cannabis, and there's a 30-day storage requirement for that video surveillance. And then rule two, um, this is kind of a synopsis of what's required for the cultivation portion and the retail portion, is a locked perimeter security alarms. Um, similar video surveillance requirements to what's required in the DPS rule, but with a 90-day storage requirement. And then um, employee badges. I mean, with the cloud and everything, I can't see that day storage requirement being a <coughs> more restrictive. Yeah, that was the one piece where it is sort of the opposite direction, but generally, I think, yeah. Yeah. This. I mean, if, if, if existing facilities are either operating with more restrictive security requirements, it shouldn't be too challenging for them to meet our our security requirements. Well, I mean, I don't think we're allowed to do a 90 day um, if there's 30 day under DPS. So I would suggest we use rule two and then just change that 90 to 30 for the dispensaries. I mean, because we are supposed to align the two programs mm -hmm. to the extent we can. <coughs> so. Again, it'll just make when we're reviewing these applications things a little bit easier if we have one standard. You all agree, Brandon and David, that we have to be 30? Um, I think, yes, if you're really abiding by uh, the requirement that you be no uh, less, no more restrictive than. I guess my point was, was, is that really restrictive? By, I guess you're paying a little bit more for the cloud each month to keep it for two months longer. So yeah, it gets to how tight we are with the word restrictive. Yeah. Is that restrictive or is that just another nominal payment? I don't know if it's nominal. I guess that was the same question I asked right before yeah. about the education and training. What does restrictive mean, no more restrictive mean? I think this is one where it, it doesn't really make much of a difference to me, but if we're going to follow strict adherence to restrictive, I think we stick with 30. And the other thing to keep in mind is the integrated licensees will be obligated to do 90. 90 so. Are you requiring an outside security company? I believe we did, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Something with expertise okay. in security. Like a commercial so, installation yeah. requirement. Yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. The word restrictive is restrictive. <laughs> I guess. Oh, and then the last one is the hemp, um, hemp rule. So I can bring that up if you'd like to look at it. And hemp, I mean, has changed significantly since 2015. Yeah, both federally and in the state. So I'm wondering how much this rule makes sense anymore. 
I tried to look at it briefly. They were growing hemp for symptom relief. We didn't want the hemp to be stolen, either since it would be a dispensary location. Little Johnny may not know that that's hemp. He may think that it's marijuana, or cannabis. I mean, and in practice, how many dispensaries are growing hemp? It's just they easier for them to work. Products, but easier for them to work with other hemp farmers. And this was developed before there were hemp rolls on file. Correct. Yeah, I don't know how to totally square that. It seems to me like we want any hemp cultivation to follow the Agency of Agriculture rules, not the that. DES <laughs> rules. Um, yeah, there was a thing in statute, well, there still is in total. March, but that they don't have to comply with Title VI, Chapter 34. Is that for the dispensaries? It's in Title 18, Chapter 86. But what is the what is six BSA? Uh, the, the hemp. Yeah, it's they don't have to comply with the hemp rules. Has that been updated since 2015, though? It's in statute. I guess I'll just look to see what that is. Yeah, we don't have to go away, the right? process, but <laughs> we don't really have to fix this now. Um, do we bring? No, we don't. Um, I do think that the, 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 the thinking was to give you an opportunity to think about um, what you would like to do in the medical program rule about hemp. If you'd like to um, keep thinking about that and revisit it on Friday or next week, okay. we have plenty of time. Okay, why don't we do that? I didn't I didn't look at that cross-reference. I'm trying to think how to square this with no more restrictive than a current DPS rule. I mean, I certainly think that it leaves in, yeah, that changing it to the agricultural rule or significantly reducing the role of this is within your discretion under the statute. You can, you can do either of those things if you wanted. I don't think you have to decide now, as we mentioned, there's time to give this one some more thought. Okay. Well, that looks like the last slide. That's the end of your list. Yep. Okay, is there anything else you want us to discuss while we are in an open meeting? Not, I, not from me. Nope. Okay. Okay, well, um, why don't we move to public comment then? And uh, we don't have anyone who joined us. Uh, so we'll go to people that joined via the link. Um, if you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. We'll call on you on the order that your hands are raised. Uh, start with Amelia. Hi guys. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to agree with the point that Julie made earlier about mandatory education in the dispensaries. Um, I think that there needs to be a set program statewide that each dispensary employee has to go through education wise so that everybody's on the same level. Um, I don't think it should just be that we require the dispensaries to educate their employees and then just let them figure out how they want to do that. Um, I think that's going to create a lot of discrepancies in knowledge. So I think that there needs to be one set education program that every medical dispensary employee has to go through. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, next is THC Analytics. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to reiterate what Amelia just said. Uh, we have a program for alcohol 
when a server when a server gets certified to be uh, to serve alcohol behind a bar, uh, he has to go through a alcohol program. Uh, the state should have something along the lines to serve the same way for cannabis uh, as, a, as a way of education. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, that would like to make a public comment, uh, please raise your virtual hands. Uh, Tito Byrne next. Um, hi guys, today um, I just wanna bring up the vape tax again. Um, I'm just going to be a broken record about this until something happens, or at least it becomes part of the conversation. I, I just don't hear anybody talking about this vape tax. Um, we have um, we have two different rules for the exact same product. Um, current dispensaries uh, do not have to pay this vape tax on the same exact item uh, that uh, that my vendors do, um, and the the products are clearly intended for cannabis, not tobacco. We just need to keep drawing this line in between cannabis and tobacco and carving the language out to remove cannabis from from the language um, and uh, from all of my dealings with this issue it was never intended for cannabis in the first place this issue is to uh, combat jewel nicotine use in high schools which we all agree is a terrible thing and uh, and, and if anything cannabis is the answer to have these problems so I, I just want to point that out we need some language there and uh, and get this vape tax uh, in in the communications um, at these meetings uh, I'd love to hear I'd love to see some action on that uh, thank you. Thanks, Tito. Uh, next is Francis Janik. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, hang on a second while I get my notes up here. Gonna do one screen at a time. Uh, first of all, S16 allowed patients to be caregivers. Um, I did actually lobby for that a while back, so I know that was in the bill, so I don't know why it's not in the DPS rules. Um, and the plant count is not combined or increased per household at any time in any legislation that I had seen. I would ask that we do increase the plant count again. Uh, 10 or 15 would be good for a medical patient uh, for, for a number of reasons. I'm also concerned that the MMJ program administrator has is not aware of the, the large amounts of products that were removed uh, by a principal of Champlain Valley. The legislators were informed about this and the GPS was informed as I've previously stated. These products were accounted for by placing in accounts where patients never came for product. And um, I have direct witness to this and in and, and this, and this thing. So I'm concerned that that is not coming up. Um, uh, there are some other things that I'll put into writing for you later. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. Um, anyone else for a public comment? Do we have anyone that joined via phone? Uh, we have two that have joined via phone. Uh, if you're on your phone and you'd like to comment, uh, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Hi, this is Jesse Lynn Dolan. Are you able to hear uh, me? Can you hear me? Oh, we are. You go first. Oh, sorry. Okay, we're both phone. Let's start with Jesse Lynn. Hi, thanks as always for taking public comment. I appreciate it. Just wanted to mention a few things. Um, I'll second what Amelia said. I think we really desperately need a standardized, mandated education statewide. We should not be having um, adult use, having more standardized and prepped education than we have our medical. So please um, you know, continue to work with that. I'd also wanted to throw out there that if we can consider, con the conversation around patients being able to shop at adult use retail dispensaries without paying taxes. And if so, um, I would love to see them also be able to do transportation to patients. And if that needs to come in a locked bag, so be it. But I would love to see that based on both geographical and environmental protection so that we don't have dispensaries driving all over the place. When we have a dispensary right up the road, that's adult use. So hopefully patients cannot pay taxes and a benefit from delivery service, which is so needed for patients, especially during the pandemic. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was as far as who should visit dispensaries, I would love to see that open to students as we talk about having educational and incubator programs, consider having students allowed in the dispensaries for visits. 
Um, I wanted to mention that my understanding of a patient and a caregiver is that you are then, if you are registered to be both, you are able to grow four flowering and then 14 plants in veg. I would love to see that clarified, actually. Um, as you know, I want to see the patient count and plant count increase through legislative session, but I know that's nothing you have the power to do. Um, lastly, or you know, adult use packaging, I don't see how that should differ from medical use packaging. I don't see any reason or rhyme why we would want that different. Again, I want patients to have better access and more strain options and better geographical locations and be able to shop at adult use. So the packaging really should line up or you're looking at just confusing people who will both shop at adult use and shop at the medical dispensary. Packaging should be standardized from the medical, from the scientific, from the educational perspective that just makes sense. I also want to back what Tito is saying, that we really do need to look at legislation moving forward for the vape tax. I can provide research and articles if you want to understand more why it is much more of a healthy option to vape rather than to combust or use flame for um, inhalation of cannabis. So I wanted to second that as well for him. So uh, thank you guys again. Appreciate it. And hopefully I'll take some of this all into consideration. Lastly, just I didn't get clarification. If you guys can let us know, will there be more medical dispensary licenses up for grab or for sale in the future? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jesse Lynn. Is the other um, person who joined by phone, uh, if you have a public comment, please uh, hit star six. Hi, how you doing? Um, hey. Harry from Hinesburg. I, I uh, at the end, the last thing you guys talked about was how the medical dispensaries are exempt from the Department of Agriculture Hemp Program. I find it interesting, Kyle asked the question, why would a medical dispensary want to grow hemp? The answer is to grow illegal outdoor and greenhouse weed, as evident by the Pete's Green incident that happened years ago. Um, and they've been exempt from that hemp program for years now. So, you know, the previous caller just talked about how there's been, you know, documented stuff over and over by these guys. Um, I just want to reiterate that comment, you know, just well advertised or well, well documented, you know, publications about what happened up there. And I just found it interesting that, you know, Shane Lynn lobbied to be exempt from the hemp program years ago, you know, with the possible intent of doing what he did, you know. Um, I hope you guys can rectify this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, we have back for folks joined on the link again. We have Michelle Chapman. Hi, thank you for taking comments. I just wanted to back up what Jesse Lynn said. It is not fair for a cancer patient who needs a strain that isn't offered at their medical dispensary to have to pay taxes at a recreational dispensary. Unfortunately, a dispensary can't carry every single strain. And as we know, every disease needs a different strain. So I really hope that y'all can include that and medical patients will not have to pay the same tax at a recreational dispensary if they use them. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. And Fran, I do see your hand up. Uh, we're, we don't take repeat comments in this forum um, just because it, things very quickly turn into conversations between witnesses. Um, but uh, feel free to submit a written comment through our web portal, um, ccb.vermont.gov. And um, you can always email Nelly or the board members as well. Um, so, um, if there aren't any more public comments, then I will um, adjourn this meeting. <laughs>